Welcome back to Elden Ring The Ultimate Guide Part 18. Today is Kayla's Part 2. Now, if this is the first time you've watched any of these guides, we recommend you watch the video linked in the description below. Otherwise, if you've got any tips of your own, stick them in the pinned tips comment. That way people can reference that as well. So there's extra stuff, more knowledge floating about, or, you know, we're sharing the good stuff. But otherwise, we were at Swamp of Aeonia, and we are heading southeast-ish um, past the crows. Uh, we already grabbed that golden seed. Um, but yeah, we are heading this way because we are going to do the second part of Caled. Uh, so we're picking up the Fandaggers from uh, that debris, I suppose. And um, yeah, this I think I think the hardest bit is maybe ah I don't know. We've got the swamp coming up. That's that's a bit of a pain in the ass. You got Celia as well, but we're coming up on a scarab here now. There's a monstrous crow on the trees above you. Um, so once you kill this thing, you're just gonna bolt for the door to the Caleb catacombs. Aye. There you go. You just saw it land there. You're gonna bolt for the door, get inside, and rest at the grace just to de-aggro the enemy, move it back to its anchor position, um, and then we'll be progressing on through the catacomb. Because we are absolutely not fighting any of the crows in this area, because they are way harder than they ought to be, as we mentioned in the last part. Now, I think this is another imp catacomb, I think. No, uh, this part... one's a skeleton catacomb. Is it? Okay, okay. Yeah. So, as those skeletons in this catacomb, they regenerate. Now, to stop the regeneration process, well, actually, okay, there are skeletons. We're going to use Sacred Blade. Now, you're going to go pick up Sacred Blade, and you're going to pick up that Glove Wart as well. Make sure you're doing exactly what we're doing. But, uh, yeah, Sacred Blade will stop the skeletons respawning. Or reassembling, whatever you want to call it. It also does a ton of damage to them. So, yeah, it's definitely worth getting. Um, there's a little bit of rot in this area, but that's okay, because we have Flame Grant Me Strength, which you should definitely have. And then there's a uh, Flame Marantis. Cleanse Me, not, not Flame uh, Grant Me Strength. Oh, flame sorry. Cleanse me. Flame Cleanse Me is what gets rid of the Scarlet Rot. Um, now, I'm just going to ignore these flowers. Um, we're just going to run past this bit, because uh, there's really no need to fight them. And there we go, Flame Cleanse Me, paying dividends as ever. Now, it doesn't really matter what build you're using. Honestly, we really recommend that you uh, get Flame Cleanse Me. I mean, funnily enough, it really doesn't matter at all, because by combining the Physic tier and the Two Fingers Heirloom, you can give yourself 15 faith, no matter what. So it doesn't I matter mean, which Flash but... Start has, you can cast that by some means. Now, just to make a point, you saw us, we um, hit that wall there, and there was a there was a lever behind the wall. So that's how you open the door to the boss, via hidden wall. Yeah, epic. So this boss is a cemetery shade. I'm not sure if this is the... I don't think this is the first one I've came, came, came across, rather. But um, they can do a ton of bleed buildup. But the thing is, is that because we have Sacred Blade, there's kind of nothing to worry about. Now, you want, they, they can do a ton of damage to you, don't get me wrong. But as you can see, they are so, so weak to holy damage. That's the strategy. Just don't get hit, hit it with two sacred blades. Like, it's barely a boss. And uh, and for our efforts, we get the Kindred of Rot spirit, Ash. I mean, not a very good reward, but then again, not a very good boss. Not a very long catacomb. This, nah. this may be one of the ones you might want to just not do. There's really nothing in there that's worth picking up. Uh, so, sorry for the wonky edit, but, um, yeah, just to show that there was a, there was a mushroom uh, <laughs> in that tent, and then also there is a small little butterfly just behind the wall, which I guess I missed the first time around, so, yeah, sorry for the weird edit. Hopefully you can kind of piece together where we are. Okay, Edit and Tony here again. So, You'll see the castle over in the distance, that's Castle Redmain. We're not doing that just yet, that is for the next part. It's just big enough to constitute its own part, so that's why we're not rolling in, in this part. But yeah, that is definitely one of the, the worst dungeons in the game. There's kind of just nothing. It's like, why the fuck is it there? It's there to fill space. Literally, yeah. Um, I will mention something interesting about this grace. So we were right in front of the impassable Great Bridge. Um, there is a sending gate there, and that can take you straight to Redmain Castle, but it's not currently active because the festival isn't currently active. 
So if you try and run down that bridge, you will get pelted with trebuchets. Um, climbing up this little watchtower here, there's a couple of red main soldiers. Um, if you wanted to pull up their drops, Tony. Um, yeah, so say what you're yeah. going to say, and then I'll talk about the drops. Yeah, sure. Um, also, we're going to be grabbing the arrow sting talisman from a chest at the top of here, but at this grace, um, you'll find three guillemots. They're the small birds that you can farm um, four-toed foul feet from. So that is your best spot for farming four-toed foul feet, which you can use to make gold-pickled foul feet, which you can consume to get 20% more runes from any enemy you kill. So in a boss fight, if you pop it right before you kill the boss, that's 20% more runes from the boss. So we're jumping off from here uh, using Torrent uh, to get up to... Because this is, this is kind of inaccessible without using Torrent. And then... Uh... Yeah, there's a there's a scarab here. I think this drops something quite good actually, from what I remember. Cragblade. Yeah, so we're actually going to use Cragblade later on because it's uh based in Cragpilled, but um, currently there's no real use for it. But later on, it it's it's pretty good. It's just like a generic buff. But we are now running away until we can warp back to um, the Ionia Swamp. The else. drops for the red main soldiers. Ah, yes. So the red main soldiers can um, can essentially just drop what they're wearing. Uh, so uh, there's a bit more to talk about that more important than the drops currently. So in here are some flowers, but there's some uh, pretty good items in this bit of the swamp. Uh, there's a meteorite staff, and there is a golden four. But there's also a meteorite, I think, or meteor smash or something like that, right? Rock sling. Yeah. Right. Um, and you, I use a Pokemon though, we'll move or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll be getting the perfume set and our first perfume bottle. Now that's uh, an infinite use crafting item akin to like the, the cracked pots and the ritual pots. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they craft some pretty powerful consumables and we'll make use of a couple of them later on. But this is Roxling. Um, the meteorite staff, by the way, um, has a pretty hefty intelligence requirement for early on in the game of, I think, 25. But... If you came here and grabbed that straight off the bat, it has S scaling in intelligence and cannot be upgraded. So it is pretty much your early to mid game staff for sorcery casting until yeah. you get over the sort of 50 intelligence threshold, at which point other staffs will start to outpace it. Well, that's what I was, that's what I was going to say about Roxling. So now apparently you can use Torrent to jump up this wall to get to the the um the great jar that we uh that we fought at the end of uh the sea over river episode but regardless we are in the swamp of Ionia now thankfully um we won't take any rot damage if we're on torrent now grabbing this grace we are about to fight uh the boss or i think there's a couple of things we're going to do first before fighting the boss um we have to be invaded by millicent ed and tony back again so something i really wanted to mention Quite specifically, I do mention it in the voiceover coming up, but I want to really hammer this home. If you haven't been following along with this guide one to one, and you haven't done Limgrave Part One, there's going to be items in your game that you're going to see that you don't see in this footage currently. The reason for that is you can actually come here super early from Limgrave uh, via a teleporter. And as such, there is an amount of useful items in this area that we want to pick up at that point in the game because it is, does give you a little bit of a boost. So ultimately, I kind of recommend that you just go back and watch Limgrave Part 1 and then just skip ahead to the Caelid part and then you can use that as the guide for the items that are currently missing. Um, and just kind of walk about this part of the swamp until eventually you'll get invaded. I, I don't know why it took so long for us, but in this kind of middle bit is uh, where she'll eventually show up. And um, once you get knocked off Torrent, you can then use that. You you know that's the cue to start putting your um, Golden Vow on and take your Physic. Because uh, you know that you're about to get invaded at that point. And then Millicent will um, fucking dynamic entry, apparently. Um, <laughs> but as Millicent is a, a humanoid, we can just use Aslam. And uh, uh, there you go, that's Millicent done. She drops... Three gold runes, apparently. <laughs> Series of question marks. And some sacramental buds. Now, 
you didn't really get a flavor for it there, but patrolling around in the swamp are some clean rot knights. Now, when you're waiting for Millicent to invade, um, they can gang up on you, so just be wary of their presence. Um, we fought a couple of clean rot knights in the last part, so... But for now, we are coming up on Commander O'Neill, kind of a solo boss standing in the middle of the swamp. Yes, so... He's not really guarded by, like, a fog wall or anything like that. If you just walk into this area, it'll start the boss fight, as you'll see in a second. I can't remember whose summon sign that is. I think it's Millicent? It's Pollyanna. Um, right. Millicent's Pure youngest God. sister. Oh, okay, so basically Millicent. So you can summon for this boss fight, but doing so will buff the boss, and this boss is uh, kind of kind of hardy, actually, as, as far as bosses at this point in the game go, so actually probably not worth really buffing now this boss can actually put out like a ton of damage summons a bunch of cronies to attack you so even even the imps kind of struggle to actually do much against this boss um as you can see when the boss charges up you want to get the fuck away from it because it can do a ton of damage now, the cool news is, is that just like fighting the Crucible Knights, just like fighting the Bell Baron Hunters, Aslam does kind of put in dividends against this boss in the sense that when you're doing Aslam, a lot of his attacks can just miss you because you go above his attack and under his attack. So um, it's quite cool in that sense. But as you can see, that attack's doing quite a lot of damage to us if he hits you with it. So, yeah, I mean, look, this guy is kind of difficult, right? But luckily, Aslam does put in the work. And um, there is... So this guy is a copy of a boss we're going to fight later. Um, and in that boss, we use the Bewitching Branches. Now, you might think that the Bewitching Branches are good in this particular area. But he just has too many summons for them to like really play a huge part. You also get the uh, Commando Standard and the Unilod Golden Needle. And I'll speak about them in a little while. Better than editing Tony here. Instead of in a little while, I'm going to button and talk about it right now. So first off, we've got the um, broken needle. You're going to take that to Sage Gowry um, and get it fixed as part of Millicent's quest. We're going to be covering that in this episode, so don't worry about him. We'll talk about him when we get to him. And the commander's standard is a halberd. It's the longest halberd in the game. It's upgraded with somber stones, so it's not a bad option early on. And it has rallying standard as an ash of war, which is similar to Golden Vow in that it buffs damage for you and your allies. And with that, back to the video. But when it comes to Commander Neil, if he is too hard, there is so many different ways to cheese him. And the main one we're going to show you in a second. And um, what you could need to do is you need to go into his boss room. Uh, you don't need to be on top. Well, you actually do need to be on torrent. Uh, you'll see why. But he can leave his boss room, which is very interesting. So you're going to drag him outside this... Um, Ring of Trees, I guess, near the Grace. It's, it's so strange. Like, no other boss acts like this in the game, really. But see these, like, um, geezers of piss, I guess? Uh, you want to kind of drag him into one of these and then just kite him around in the same spot and they'll just keep, like, punting him with damage. And uh, this is a, a fairly quick way of cheesing him. And you can do this right at the start of the game when you get teleported here from Limgrave if you really want to. It's uh, just a very a very easy way of defeating Commander O'Neill. You could indeed sneak up behind him and use Poison Mist, but if you're going to do that method, you might as well do this method. You could also go up really high on the branches and just pelt him with arrows. That also works. So, I, I mean, this this is Commander O'Neill. Um, he's probably the most straight-up fair fight that you've fought to this point because he has quite a lot of poise. So, as much as Aslam's good at avoiding his attacks, it's, um, you can't really knock him on his arse quite as much as other enemies, and he also does, like, a ton of damage. So, if anybody has any particular strategies for O'Neill, then, yeah, stick them in the comments if you have any. But otherwise, just do the cheese method if he's too difficult. That is that is the official stance. But now, we are heading north, and we are hugging, um, sorry for another weird edit. But we're uh, hugging the, the sort of cliffside whilst we're going north through the through the swamp. But there's an item that I missed on the first take. And it was this... Um... I don't even know what the fuck that is, actually. It was a set of poison blooms. So it almost wasn't worth picking up. But uh, we stopped at the 
grace at the town of Celia. The spot we just stopped there would have been where we picked up the rot dog very yes. early on. This is a rune arc. And then the next thing we'll be doing... So right here as well. So I wanted to show you the things that there would be an invisible scarab on that shore. However, uh, we already got it when we came here the first time. So if you want a, another small refresher on this part of Caled, you can indeed go back to um, Limgrave part one or two. I can't. I think it's part one. Uh, and we get teleported here via Limgrave and we picked up some stuff because it is worthwhile picking up that early in the game. Uh, we actually get teleported into this particular um, cave, actually. So now we're actually going to do the cave for realsies this time. And um, it, it, obviously far too difficult when you're coming here from Limgrave, but in this case, we're now at the perfect level to do it. So there's a bunch of miners in this area. There's a bunch of kindreds of rot. And uh, so there's also like a lot of upgrade materials jammed in the walls. So we're going to grab them while we can. But also, we want to kind of take care of these Kindred of Rot as quickly as possible. Thankfully, Aslam does a lot of damage, but their stupid, sticky, fucking cum attack or whatever the fuck is a, a massive nightmare in this area because they just keep pelting you and it's got insane tracking. So, first things first, we're going to kill these motherfucking things because uh, they're a, a fucking pain in our arse and then we can pick up the shit that's like lodged in the walls. Yeah, I don't think it helps in this cave that it's as vertical as it is. Because these no, guys can no. just pelt you from way the fuck up top while you're still running around on the bottom trying to pick things up. So, yeah, 100% your best bet is to deal with them first. Now, there is a third one on a platform just above where we are now, but it doesn't wake up until you go up there. So after those first two are dead, you can run around, you can pick up these. Are these smithing stone fives? Uh, yes, so that's uh, very handy. Uh, we also picked up our golden rune five in, in the little shack. Now, these miners are just, uh, gonna, they're too busy. Um, they've got mouths to feed, so they're not going to attack you. Yeah, I mentioned in an earlier part that if the miners are actively mining something, as long as you don't pick up what's in front of them, they won't aggro onto you, so you're good to go in that regard. Uh, now, if you... The, so, I guess this miner's coming after you, but... Uh, they can drop the digger staff, they can drop somber smithing stones, they can drop glintstone scraps and large glintstone scraps. And the kindred of rot can drop the pests glaive, faded early flower, and aeonian butterfly. So, we're gonna come, we're, we will come back and get that item on the rafters, but otherwise, do this uh, series of jumps, get over that wall, and then this is how we get to the top part of this uh, cave, I guess. Yeah, another thing to note is in this cave there would have been a rock grease and in the hut that had the uh, kindred of rot standing on top of it would have been some gravity stone fans and or chunks. Um, yes. But since we'd already been here in episode one or two, um, we've already collected those items and so there was no need for us to go to the locations where they would be. But the rock grease would be almost at the grace. And as I said, the gravity stone items would have been in the hut with the kindred on top of it. So there's two more smith and stone fives, and we also picked up rock blaster from the uh, from the chest. Now I think we mentioned mm. rock blaster in an earlier part, where this is essentially the attack that the the uh, the the mining guy, the, like the these guys, will do to you. And rock blaster is the upgraded version, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's spot on. So I think the other version's called something like Shatter Earth or something like that, but Rock Blaster is the more powerful version of it. So once you get this spell, it completely outclasses the previous version. There's a Somber Smith and Stone 4 on the wall. And not only that, if you use the Digger Staff to cast it, it does more damage. Yes, I think you said yeah, that. Yeah, it would yeah. even do more damage if you had two Digger Staffs and you had one in each hand. You get the bonus applied twice. So this is the easy drop to get the Cuckoo the cuckoo glintstones um you i mean that's just a consumable that does a little magic thing right yeah yeah you yeah. throw it and it makes magic orbs some of the ray lucaria soldiers were doing it to you in the earlier parts but uh yeah so that's that's if you don't make that initial jump to get it which you can do then you can just do that drop off but it's also like basically not worth it 
So another kindred of rot in here. Let's get that to fuck. Fuck these guys. And um, we've got a pretty tough boss coming up, actually. This one might be a bit of a wall for some of you. I mean, you just said that um, O'Neill was probably the toughest thing we fought so far. Yeah, for about 10 seconds until we come here and fight this. This is way tougher than O'Neill. So, we're about to pick up a talisman. It's Faithful's Canvas Talisman, which increases the potency of your incantations by 4%. There is a better version that we get off Gowrie later on. Yeah, th th this is one of the few things about, like, you're never going to have a build. Smith and Stone 5 in the wall. You're never going to have a build that's going to have complete coverage, and this is one enemy in the game that, frankly, doesn't give us perfect coverage. Now, a bit of a weird edit there. What we had done is we went back to the Grace and came back here to to get um we just run run past everything but we just wanted to get our uh, our flasks and that back again for the boss now for this boss the imps are doing fuck all so we're going to be using luteal for this one because he can tank hits um i mean you said there's no particular build for this boss there is sorry what i mean is do we don't have a particular our build doesn't our specific build for us doesn't particularly factor in doing well in this boss. However, there are more of these bosses and we do eventually get a technique for fucking ruining them, but we just don't have access to that stuff yet. But this is the Fallen Star Beast and he is immune to Aslam and cannot be bled, which puts us on um, a bit of a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, it, this enemy has those exposed white patches that you can see, one between its jaws, one by its tail. It takes more damage if you hit that, so as you can see, that did a pretty decent chunk. Um, but then as we're hitting the sides, you're not even getting the little yellow mini bar to appear in its uh, health bar down there. Um, yeah. It's resistant to bleed, it can be poisoned, it can be rotted. Um, I think it can be frostbitten. Um which we do have access to. We we have access to cold damage. Um, but as you can see, big AoEs, they put this enemy of all things in a teeny tiny little room. Um, so if we get enough ass slams on it, we can knock it down, but it's just not consistent enough that we could like rely on ass slam. Um, all of its attacks just don't seem to really be phased by ass slam in terms of like avoiding them. You have to hit its face directly in order... So... If anybody actually has any tips with the particular build and stuff we have access to for Fallen Star Beast, but we really, really looked, and it's a case of just get good with this boss, sadly. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is an item that you can throw at its face that causes it to stagger. What was what that again? It's basically any item. So you see it drop more gravity stone fans and chunks. Um... We also got a smith and stone seven. That's huge. All right, weird editing, Tony, but this Fallen Star Beast drops a bell bearing. Now, that bell bearing lets you buy infinite Somberstone 1s and 2s if you give it to the Twin Maiden Husks. However, EJ also currently sells infinite Somberstone 1s and 2s, so it doesn't really matter that much. All right, so for once, Twin is actually wrong. The Fallen Star Beast can't be Frostbit. However, and we do mention it in this footage, it can be rotted. Now, we didn't rot this thing because we still feel that it is a little bit of, like, an involved process to do, particularly in this boss arena. But if you are struggling against the Fallen Star Beast, you can put on Rot Breath, and this is why we got it, not just for Fallen Star Beast, but for times like this, you can summon Luteal, and when the Fallen Star Beast has Luteal's aggro, you can blast it with Rot Breath because it can be rotted quite easily. It has fairly low rot resistance. You also have Rot Grease that you can put on your weapon and try and get it rotted that way if you don't have Rot Breath. And then once it's rotted, just get your 100 block shield up and keep backing the fuck away and hold your guard up. There is a video that somebody else done that shows this strategy, so I will link that in the description. But otherwise, that is... I Personally, I would say equally easy as just using Aslam. Strictly speaking, Fallen Star Beast and O'Neill are both bosses that you kind of just have to be a bit good at until a bit later in the game when we have our full repertoire of options, in which case the Fallen Star Beast becomes an absolute piece of piss. But for now, this Fallen Star Beast is going to be disproportionately difficult to other stuff that you've fought. And by all means, you can look up other cheese methods on YouTube, but in our opinion, they don't make it substantially easier. 
ultimately the best thing about our strategy is that we're just very well prepared in terms of our defense and HP and the amount of healing flasks we've got compared to what maybe other people would have at this point in the game. So, your best option is to just be very well equipped like we are. But, you still might have some issues. Yeah, this is true. So now we're going to use all those smithing stones and upgrade our gear. Um, but as you were saying, yeah, if you hit it in the face, um, that can be with a spell, that can be with the consumable. You can knock it off course as it's charging you. It's hard to do on the one in the cave because you've not got a lot of wiggle room. But the more open ones that you find in the fields later on are easier to exploit in that way. So if you are struggling, just put on some throwables and it can mitigate at least one of its attacks. Yeah, so there's just not a lot of like solid strategy for Fallen Star Beast with our particular build. The good news is it is completely optional, so you can just come back and batter it to death when you're stronger. Um, but otherwise, if you're going to do it right now with this particular build, unless somebody has a really solid fucking strategy in the comments, uh, your only option, sadly, is to just... Just kind of get good with it. Now, the, th the good thing is, though, is that if you've been following this build, you are a perfectly good level, you're going to be taking reasonable damage, you're going to be dealing reasonable damage with Aslam, and you have access to a lot of flasks. So, you can sort of... Um, the mitigation is just by being generally prepared, you know, if you've been following the guide, that is. But, we went to Swamp of Aeonia, we took this side road, and now we are at Gowrie Shack, and he is tied to Millicent's quest, which is a, a very a long-standing quest throughout the game. So, go on. Put your so, the heaven. first thing Gowrie's going to ask you to do is he's going to ask you to do a favour for him, which is retrieve the unalloyed gold needle, or the broken needle, rather, from O'Neill in the swamp. Since we've already killed O'Neill, we brought that back to him, and then he's given you the secret to the town of Celia in exchange, which tells you how to do the puzzle of Celia, but since we're here, you don't need that note. Um, once you've read the note, or ignored it completely and followed the guide, which you should be doing, um... You're asked to light three sconces, that lowers the fog gates, and he's asking you to go to the Church of the Plague on the hill above him, which is where Millicent is. Um, and once you get to Millicent, you take the needle that he just repaired for you, give it to Millicent, she wakes up, she visits the shack, go to the shack, and then that's it for now. But we will show you every stage of that as we as we progress it. Now, as I said, you need to ride through Celia. We rode straight down the main street, ignoring all the enemies, and this is the first sconce. There are three of these. There's one at the top of three of these towers, as you will see. But there's a couple of items to pick up as we're going around Celia as well. The first one there that you can see, actually, I think is the Staff of Loss. Well remembered. Yeah. And each of the sconces that you light as well will lower one of the blue fog gates hidden around the town. So we were standing next to one just there, um, heading back onto the roofs here. And we were standing next to one just there, and there are two sort of back-to-back -back in this street and then behind the same building um, along the back wall. So there's a scarab for Double Slash, which is a fantastic Ash of War that um, we actually utilise... Uh, throughout the game, actually. So, Double Slash, very, 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 super underrated, actually. Uh, so, there's a bunch of, like, annoying jumps here. As you can see, it fell off that branch trying to get onto the roof. But, uh, yeah, just you're, you're going to be a lot smarter than us, and you're going to copy what we do, but not copy the fallen part. Because, do it uh, again, but properly this time. Yeah, you're um, uh, sexy and cool, and we are not. Well, you're well, not. I'm, well, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, you, you were the one playing this game. Um, so, back over to that big branch, then we're jumping over onto this roof, and then we're going to follow this branch onto the next roof, and then do another little jump, and then that takes us to the next torch to light. And then the last one, I think, is a lot easier to get to. Yeah, it is. Um, on the topic of Double Slash, by the way, you were mentioning things you can do against the Fallen Star Beast. Double Slash works really well against it, especially if you combine it with a spell that we do have access to, Black Flame Blade. Um, this is true, can, this is true. You can take some pretty big chunks out of its health bar for not a lot of effort, as long as you have something to keep it distracted. So a decent summon like Lutel, for example. So that was a Stone Sword key we picked up. 
across the next branch, and then up to... There we go. I think from but here we now... go along the rooftops to grab one of the scarab headpieces. Yeah, I think it's the blue one. Yeah, cerulean scarab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that improves the amount your blue flasks uh, restore, the amount of FP it restores. Um, jump across to this roof here and grab the toxic mushrooms. Yep. Yeah. Um, poison grease on the ground, and then through this little uh, little pathway, I guess this is one of the um, the the blue gates that lighting the torches. Lord, now that's another imbued sword key. I think that's the the last of the three that we needed to finish the four belfries section of the game. So we'll be going to that later on. Don't worry. And I but, think the uh, next the next stage of Celia is going to be picking up the other two rewards that you get yes. for lowering those fog gates. Um, we might be grabbing the painting first, though. Yeah, we do. Um, this so painting's it... kind of a bitch to get to, um, location-wise. Oh, but is that the, you... the golem yeah. one? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, you don't go get down... that till way later. Yeah, way, way, <laughs> yeah. way later. Yeah. So we picked up Night Comet. Uh, that's a quite a cool sorcery, actually. The night sorceries, um, enemies can't see them. So you know how there's like certain enemies that dodge about a lot in relation to your uh, projectiles? The night sorceries, they don't dodge because they can't fucking see them. So that's very cool. As far as I'm concerned, it's the singular best spell in the entire game. Um, we've yeah, it probably is, yeah. Alisman there. Um, so, similar to the one we got before, but the amount of defense it provides to you is slightly stronger. So, you got a direct upgrade there. So, now that we let all three torches, this then unlocks the pathway that leads to Millicent. However, there is still another boss to do. And, as we we're talking about enemies that dodge a lot, uh, we're about to do one of them. Although, quickly, we're going to do the four belfry section just now. Thought I'd have left that till the end, but, okay, fuck it, we'll just do it now then. Because uh, it's pretty quick to just get out of the way. So now we've got the imbued sword key. We've already been here twice before. So we're going to do the last one. This takes us to Far Missoula. Um, and this is where we get... I know it's a talisman of some sorts. Pearl Drake. And that's the one that's like... Uh, gives you a little bit of defense for everything. Yeah, so... How you've got the Spell Drake, Flame Drake, Haley Drake... Um, and Bolt Drake Talismans for uh, Magic Fire, Holy, and Lightning, respectively. The Pearl Drake boosts all of them, but by slightly less. Well, apparently so... I was just taken aback by the view. <laughs> I mean, it is a spectacular vista. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's really one of the best in any Souls game, actually. Yeah, 100%. It's like, and this uh... is a Souls game, before anybody says anything. Yeah, so it is. I don't think anyone's we're dropping... that. We're dropping down onto these um, these platforms. Uh, sadly, it is a big enough drop that you will take damage. Either that or I've just done it badly. But the talisman is right here. Now, it, we, we want to be able to warp away, but we can't because this motherfucker has dropped down to fight us. Uh, he's also, because he's such a late game enemy, he's like harder than most bosses at this point. <laughs> so, uh, what you want to do, you could use rejection, theoretically, or you can try and line them up and kick them off the edge. Thankfully, their attacks are quite easy to dodge. So as much as he's got tons of health and he'll hit you hard, uh, you can just backstab him to death fairly painlessly. Ideally, the best thing you do here is actually just make sure you don't have many souls when you come to uh, the four belfries. So then you can just drop off the edge and it just doesn't matter because you're not losing anything. But now we are going to fight the Nox Twins boss, which is one of these bosses that uh, dances about a lot. However, the the imps, again, just really fucking good. They're just so better. <laughs> yeah. It's almost painful, actually, because there are so many interesting spirit ashes in the game, but you can pick the imps at the start, and they will carry you until you get the mimic. And then the mimic will literally. carry you until you get Tish. What? <laughs> Now, there is an alternative spirit that you could use. You could summon the marionette soldiers for this boss fight, which will cause these guys to basically continuously dodge and not attack, which is quite funny. Uh, because, again, these... Uh, by, by the way, I'm not telling you a strategy for this boss. This is two guys 
Um, like, I could fight both of these guys in real life and win. So, like, it's... it's kind of clock them in the jaw, right? Aye. I mean, look, look. Th this did not require... If you've got... Yeah, this boss doesn't need... You get the Nox Flowing Sword. That's a cool weapon. And uh, then we get the Lusat's Glintstone Staff. Uh, so, statistically speaking, strongest staff in the game. It, you will achieve the highest spell damage possible by using Lusat's staff. Well, worth getting then. So now we're on this uh, path, like, road, which is the the door we unlocked from doing the, the Light the Three Torches thing. There is a big rolling orb. Uh, I guess it's it's not like that. It's kind of like a guard dog, but it's a giant ball, I suppose. Uh, so just make sure I you avoid only that. only barks once. Yeah. Um, now we're at Church of the Plague. Please tell me that's what it's called. Thank fuck. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yes, we're grabbing a sacred tear and we are just resting at the grace because we don't need to fight those things. And you've noticed Millicent is sitting there in the corner. As I said, you come here with the repaired needle that you got from Gowrie. You give it to Millicent. Your screen will fade to black. She'll fall asleep. You sit at the grace, um, and she'll be standing up, clutching where her arm would be if she still had one. Um, she'll give you a talisman, and then go to Gowrie's shack. And we have a fun method that I think I showed you for getting back to Gowrie's shack a lot faster from the church. To yes. Play. So you have yeah. to rest in order to get her to stand up, but then she gets and you likewise the prosthesis to get it to move. So she gives you the prosthesis. Prosthesis. The fuck. She gives you a fucking heirloom. What does it do? Prosthesis, whereas Heirloom gives you plus five dexterity in the same um, order of talismans as the Two Fingers talisman and the uh, Star Scourge Heirloom that we picked up earlier in Caelid. Aye. So we can drop down here. So actually, I don't think we're going to do the Gowrie thing just now. Uh, there's a bunch of other enemies in this area. Now, there's some bats here, so we are going to be using um, blood, uh, Bloody Slash to kill them because it is quite good. But there's a Drawstring Poison Grease here. It's imperative that you pick that up. <sighs> oh yeah, you can't skip that. I mean, we, I mean, it one shots the last boss. So, you know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, don't get grabbed by these things. <laughs> like, perfect demonstration there. It really hurts. So if you see them sort of rear up and raise the claws, get ready to dodge because if it hits you, it does a lot of damage. So that is Golden Rune 9, though, which is why we're fighting these things. So they do drop quite a substantial amount of souls each, um, just given off the back of that. Um, the normal bats don't, but the singing ones absolutely do. And it's, it's the quite bats great. bats can drop low-level Golden Runes, though. Sure, so sure. You may get some bonus from that. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely worthwhile um, killing the singing ones. And it's just great how good Bloody Slash is for killing these fucking things. Good range, good damage, builds up bleed. One more one. Not that good though. This range isn't that good. It's a bit, it's a bit it's just a bit of a it's just a bit boring in it. Yeah, there's just there's not a lot going on here. We're just cleaning up these harpy enemies. Um there's a few of them scattered about. Once you can't hear singing anymore, you know you've killed them all. Um, yes. There is a troll and a bunch of demi-humans at the far end of this uh, path. Grabbing this item first, though, another golden rune. But there's no items over there, so we never go to that troll. He's the one who was throwing the big magic pots at you when you yes. were below this gate earlier. Now there's going to be some illusory sorceries in here. Uh, say hello to them as you ride past, because fuck fighting him. We got um, the, uh, some key bolts, and uh, now we're just... I think there's a Bloodhound Knight up here. And then a spell. I don't know, it's a gravity spell? It's not a gravity spell. Is it not? Ugh. No, it's a night sorcery. Um, it's eternal darkness. What it does is it puts a little orb above your head that will eat incoming magical projectiles. So, um, That's cool. A fucking goat wants a bit. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> a goat with a death wish. <laughs> so, warping back to Church of the Plague, I think now we're going to go to Gowrie. And uh, the quickest way of getting there, actually, is from Church of the Plague. And then you can run down to this tree here. And then there's a little drop-down part that um, isn't protect... Like, it looks like this would just kill you. But actually, uh, it doesn't. And that is how you get to Gowrie nice and quick. 
So Melisent's here now. Gary's presumably hiding somewhere in a bush, but you talk to Millicent, uh, exhaust a dialogue, as you should with every NPC, exhaust their fucking dialogue. Save and quit, and then Gowry's back, and now he becomes a sorcery merchant. He sells some pretty good stuff. Um, specifically, Night Maiden's Mist is very, very strong. It puts a patch of damage that can hurt you, so be careful if you're going to use it. Puts a patch of damage out there that sort of ignores enemy defenses, it just deals a constant rate of damage. Yeah, it's quite um, cool that way. And later he sells a miracle when you progress uh, Millicent's quest a little bit more. So grab a Starlight Shard here, and then we're going to show you one spot where a very specific enemy will spawn. Yes, so near this area, uh, I don't think it's necessarily back here, but in this here, that guy there, that is one of this one of the few skeletons in the game that you can farm for the executioner's axe. Or the executioner's great axe. One of the Executioner's other. Great Axe, yeah. Um and the special thing about that is it's a great axe with a critical hit modifier on it. So if you take reposts or backstab, it does more damage with both of those moves. Um come up to this grave here, completely ignoring the battle mage, and then smack yep. the wall behind it. And yep, somehow you were meant to find that. Yes. Um, I mean, so it is, is tied to Sorceress Selen's quest. She does give you a note that tells you about the location of this illusory wall. What, but is, this, what, is, it, what is this game? Deus Ex? I'm not, I'm not playing I mean, blood. I'm not reading fucking logs in my Dark Souls game. It's Fallout 76. <laughs> it's terminal entries. Um, <laughs> it's all there is. <laughs> So anyway, though, uh, now we are in Celia Hideaway. Uh, we want to do this just now because we might as well get out of the way. We need to come here a couple of other times. I think it's just one more time. But uh, because we can warp here, we're like, well, fuck it. We might as well. We're on the beaten path. We might as well get this done now because uh, there's items here, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there's some pretty good stuff here as well. Um, you get a decent sorcery from beating the boss. Um, the boss will look pretty familiar, but slightly more intimidating, especially if you're on an earlier patch. Um, and you get a decent spirit ash in this area. Um, yeah, there's some good stuff scattered about. Uh, apparently nothing in here actually has any relevant drops, so there we go. There's a battle mage, apparently, at some point. He was outside. Yeah, he was yeah. standing in front of the, the tomb that was marking the entrance to this place. So ultimately, when I first came here, I did find it quite difficult to navigate. So just kind of follow the path that we were following across these big purple crystals. Um, and there's a there's like a quite a lot of secret bits in here, actually, surprisingly. For for a for a cave in Elden Ring, there's a surprising amount to this one. I mean, I guess this is one of the more visually interesting caves in Elden Ring as well, like with the big purple crystals jutting out of the walls and things dotted about and it's very vertical like a lot of the caves in Kaelid actually there's a lot of height to this one yeah um, no you know what I think I think I do agree with that one the, the big the big purple crystals are quite striking um, I think they are used maybe once or twice later in the game but so strictly speaking it's a fairly unique thing as far as Elden Ring assets go because uh, apparently almost nothing is sacred in, these, in this game <laughs> Um, Even enemies from previous games that aren't safe, they just have new skins. Aye, aye, literally. So drop it down at the bottom, we can we can actually walk all the way up this crystal wall and kind of jump over it. It kind of feels like you shouldn't be able to do that, but this is intentional. But there's a revenant down here, but luckily we have our handy dandy back pocket heal. So we are going to um, try and fire that off as uh, quickly as we can. We're, I'm, I'm kind of holding the charge in. And then I'm going to let it Which go when it can... Which is something you can do if you didn't know. You can hold on to a heal spell for as long Aye. as you need. And as you can see, its range is quite big. And for your I will, effort, um, some uh, I will actually extend warp. from that and say that um, the visual AoE is not the actual AoE. So yeah. you see it projected like a holy ring on the floor, and the same goes in reverse. So some of the higher level healing spells have a much bigger visual AoE, but their range is actually the same as the normal heal. Uh, and we also picked up a Lost Ash of War and a Somber 4. God, we have Somber 4s coming out our fucking balls like Jesus Christ. 
So this is again the reason that somber weapons are so much easier to upgrade. Like you get so much power so quickly with somber yeah. weapons compared to normal smithing stones. It's kind of disproportionate, actually. A possible uh, thing that you could have done is use Bloodhound's Fang for the um, for the Fallen Star Beast. So through this oh, little, yeah, um, that'll work fine. Yeah, so that's, that's something you could also theoretically do for the Star Beast that maybe make it a little bit easier. But yeah, through that invisible wall, we got the uh, Crystal Spear. And uh, yeah, what oh, that was Crystal Spear, weapons. Crystal Staff. And we're that just heading spear, down we... to the bottom. Yeah, that one was the Spear. We got the Staff in Leonia. Cool, cool. So I think we have to head back up the top here, apparently. Yeah, there's another little, like you were saying, there's a couple of little secrets in this oh, one. Oh, it's this and one, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So You drop down this... to a very hidden area. Yeah, it doesn't even look like there even is an area here to drop to, given like the way the shadows are, so... Uh, kind of cool, and this is like a little secret bit with... Um... So, this, these are Lazuli Sorcerers and a Twin Sage Sorcerer. Uh, this is actually a great place to mention this because they were also uh, present. So we get the Crystallian Ashes doing that. But these guys were also present in Celia. Now, the ones with the swords can drop the... Um, those. The ones with the swords specifically are the Lazuli Sorcerers. They can drop the Glintstone Sword and the Lazuli Robe. So yeah, the Twin Sage and the Glintstone Sorcerers can drop the Sorcerer sets. That's the Real Carrion Robe, the Manchettes and the Leggings. They can also drop the Academy Glintstone Staff. Not only that, there's a little edit coming up where it fades to black. That is actually us going back to the, the original Grace and resting to refill our healing flasks. Um, oh, okay. So now we're going to do the boss. It is triple Crystallian this time. And uh, we're going to be summoning Lutel because, again, this is one of the few things that the, um, the Imps can't really handle. Um, now, what we've done before this boss is we head we headed back to the start of the cave, and then we came through the cave again to reset our flasks. But this boss dies to Aslam. If you're having any issues whatsoever, just put Aslam on, a, I don't know, fucking anything. Like a dagger or something, it just doesn't matter. Put Aslam on anything, and then this is how you defeat this boss. Really, the only thing you'd even remotely have to take into account is to either kill the sorcerer first, or just avoid the sorcerer. And that stupid fucking stab attack off the spearman. Fuck that guy. Um, but literally, th this boss is not going to give anybody any problems when Aslam exists. And then once the little armor coating falls away, you can start to attack them normally, whatever weapon you've got. I do want to say, actually, that um, you'll have noticed, no doubt, in the footage, that sometimes these enemies just stand still. And that yes. was after a certain patch that killed the AI of multi-target bosses. So if more than one of them is attacking you at once, um, that's a very rare thing you're experiencing on current patch. Um, yeah, it used to be this so, boss was difficult because they would just all gang up on you. Uh, yeah, at one point this much. fight was borderline impossible. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got like, Crystal Torrent for that. And that uh, is pretty much Celia Hideaway. Now... Quickly, the, the Twin Sage Sorcerer, which is the one with the double he big head thing, uh, that can drop the um, real carrier robes. So the robes, the manchettes, the leggings, and the glintstone staff. Um, yeah, no, no, I that. guess that's it. Yeah, that's it. Coming out of Silly Hideaway, though, you're going to take the Spirit Spring up to the top of this big skull. And there's yep. some items on the top of here. Uh, some high-level smithing stones and a stone sword key. And now we are officially in Grail's Dragon Barrow. Now, this is not Kaelid. This is way higher level than But we're coming here to grab a couple of items specifically. And I think, do we kill Grail in this? We do kill Grail in this, yes. So, Grail is the giant dragon that you see kind of stuck in a ditch to the side. You can come here right at the start of the game and kill Grail. Now, there is a specific reason why. Well, one, we forgot to mention it. But two, we also specifically weren't going to mention it because it ruins the game by doing this. It makes it so laughably, trivially easy. Um, but you can literally just run here straight from the start of the game. But to capitalize on this, you will gain like 150,000 souls or something cra crazy like that, right? Now, the good news is, is that we are the, uh, went the samurai class, so we have a bleed weapon. And that's really the only way you're going to be able to kill this thing remotely easily. 
Uh, now, what you can do is put on the Endurance Talisman and make sure that you have the Scarab Head, the Gold Scarab Talisman, and also a Pickled Foul Foot. That way you're going to get maximum souls out of killing this guy. You could also spam Reduvia's Blood Blade at this thing as well. That'll do a lot of bleed build-up also. Uh, apparently I actually switched to doing that, so there's me using the Reduvia. But once you've finally bled this thing out, it will die. Now remember, again, when it dies, get your gold pickled foul foot on the ready. Now that it's dead, munch it. And uh, now that we've got the gold scarab talisman on, we will get many, 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 many a soul. And because we've taken the foot and we've got the talisman, we'll get even many or a soul. Which is a, a huge amount that we just got there. I think it was, I think it was like 120,000 for doing that. Um, yeah, there or thereabouts. Um, on top of five dragon hearts as well. Which is, again, yes. an insane boost of power for right at the start of the game. Um, which is largely why we didn't do it. Um, you can also, I will mention, if you kill it from closer to its tail and you make it back to the grace before it finishes dying, when you stand up, you will receive the souls for it being killed and it will still be there. So you can abuse that even further to basically get to whatever level you want to right at the start of the game. In an hour, you can be level 120. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it because, as we're saying, it really does spoil the fun. But for now, we've come into Fort Faroth, run past a bunch of bats and a single harpy. Yeah. Um, we're not, we're not the fighting ladder. these things. Especially no, God, because no. they are way high. They are scaled so high compared to what you are right now. Now, we picked up the Dectus Medallion. Now, the reason why we're coming here is we assume that the game must want you to come here given that you need the Dectus Medallion to get to Altus Plateau. So, well, given the the big obvious this is where you're supposed to go left thing, right? Uh, but again, running past these enemies, we're going to drop down here, because uh, I'm pretty sure we get a, a pretty good item, actually. Um, well, this is a Golden Rune 12. Um, yep. And then jumping this gap here, it's kind of obscured, hidden. You get another one of the Legendary Talismans, and this is something we wear... I think until Snowfield. Yep, the Radigan's Sore Radigan Seal. Seal. Okay, final edit, Tony, for this episode. Radigan's Sore Seal is the improved version of a talisman we're already wearing, which is the Radigan's Scar Seal. So this increases your vigor, endurance, strength, and dex by five each. So that's twenty levels, but in exchange we take fifteen percent extra damage. Now, sure that is relevant, but it doesn't really play a huge factor in the amount of damage we take up until about Snowfield, as we say. Now, quickly, um, we quit out and jumped back in to de-aggro the, the fucking enemies that are coming after us. But not only that, because we have a bunch of dragon hearts for free, and we killed Greol, Greol's roar is now in the uh, the dragon communion, and we need that for the platinum. So it's actually, you have to kill Greol in order to platinum the game. So, now we're back in round table hold, and we can just use uh, all the stuff to... Just upgrade. Um, I think that's all we're doing just now, is upgrade. Yes. Yeah, but again, we decided to do this at this point in the game because it seems that that is what the game is directing you to do. If you're not supposed to come here before Altus, then why is it giving you the thing to get to Altus? It stands to reason that they are expecting you to pick up the Dectus Medallion. Yeah, to be clear, obviously you can get to Altus without having the Dectus Medallion. We've shown yes. you how to do that in a previous part. But using the Dectus Medallion, you can get to Altus without actually killing anything. Nothing needs to die to pick up both halves of the uh, Dectus Medallion. But those are our stats, that's our gear, and that'll be it for part 18. Yeah, and as you can see, we're now at 40 Vigor, 35 Endurance. So, killing Greol is actually, um, at this point, very much recommended. But yeah, we'll see you in the next one. And okay, there we go, that's Caled done. Join us in part 18, where we're going to be doing Redmain Castle. Now, other than liking and subscribing, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitch, where we will be streaming once the DLC is out. And if you're feeling especially generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon if you're so inclined. But the best thing you can do is just comment anything. Just comment anything! Go on. Anything. Two seconds. Go on. Anyway, catch you in the next part.